Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the eighth lecture in the Think Legal lecture series. Generally, we reserve this segment to introduce Think Legal Bangladesh, but I don't think that's necessary anymore. So I will uh, pass along this dais to our moderator after I say just two things. One is to welcome our honorable judges of the Supreme Court here. Uh, we have our first speaker, uh, Honorable Mr. Justice Sayed Rifat Ahmed Sir here, and we obviously have our speaker today, Madam Justice Kashifa Hussain. And second, is to, uh, you know, again, he needs no introduction, but is, the second thing is to welcome uh, our star moderator, Mr. Mustafizur Rahman Khan Bhai. Uh, a few years ago, a mentor of mine said, if you want to learn to be a good orator in court, take some time out to go and listen to Mr. Barrister Khan, Barrister Mustafizur Rahman Khan submitting. And this is one um, advice I pass along to my junior colleagues at the bar. If you are looking to improve your oratory skills in court, make sure you take some time out to go and listen to Barrister Khan when he's submitting. And with that, may I call to the dais our moderator, Barrister Mustafizur Rahman Khan. Uh, thank you very much, Anita, for those very kind words. Uh, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the eighth lecture of the Think Legal lecture series. Uh, there's been a bit of a gap since the last lecture, which happened, I think, late last year. Uh, one of the reasons was that in between, there was the first Think Legal conference, which was in May 2018, and which was, uh, by all accounts, a great success, for which credit is due to Anita, uh, Saqib, and the others. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, one of the things about the Think Legal lecture series, which uh, I personally like a lot, is the fact that this gives an opportunity for the younger members of the bar, as well as law students, an opportunity to uh, listen to lectures given by judges of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, past and present and also to fraternize with uh, senior members of the profession, as well as the judges, of course, uh, in an informal setting. I think that in the working of any legal system, uh, this is a very uh, necessary aspect. Uh, those of us who were fortunate enough to study in England are familiar with the court life in the Inns of Court. Uh, the Inns of Court gives an opportunity for this fraternization to happen. And in Bangladesh also, these uh, types of occasions give a similar opportunity. Uh, through these opportunities, uh, the younger members of the bar, future judges perhaps, are given an opportunity to understand the legacy that they are expected to uphold. And speaking of legacy, uh, this gives me an opportunity to welcome today's speaker, Honorable Madam Justice Kashifa Hussain, who personifies the legacy that I'm speaking of. Uh, she is the daughter of a very distinguished judge of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, late Justice Sayyid Mohammed uh, Hussain, and uh, uh, who was a very bold judge who gave landmark judgments in, the, uh, in upholding the rule of law and uh, human rights in Bangladesh. And uh, significantly, him along with uh, another judge, uh, another distinguished judge of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, late Justice, Sayyid, uh, late Justice Abdurrahman Chaudhuri, these two judges were uh, forcibly removed by martial law administration during the 1980s, in 1984. This was, this was during the 1980s. And I think it's a measure of divine justice that both uh, the daughter of uh, late Justice Sayyid Mahmoud Hussain, as well as the son of late Justice Abdurrahman Chaudhuri, both of them are now gracing the Supreme Court of Bangladesh as judges of the High Court Division. Today's topic 
is one which is of particular interest to practitioners of law. Laws, special laws, and effects. Those of you who are newer entrants in the profession should do well to familiarize themselves with the provisions of special laws as well as the pitfalls that these present. Uh, the term special law is not defined in any statute, but the concept comes through judicial interpretation. Essentially what happens when special laws are involved is that the parliament in its infinite wisdom creates a legal regime where special rights are created, sometimes substantively, but mostly procedural for vindicating your rights, which are an exception to the general corpus of law. Usually these reflect certain policy concerns of the legislature, but invariably the application of these special laws have very harsh effects, or they may have very harsh effects. And uh, our courts have, uh, while recognizing the provisions of, provisions of special laws, are also very vigilant in ensuring that these are interpreted in a manner so that their application is confined to the particular area which is addressed. And our Supreme Court, in its jurisdiction under Article 102 of the Constitution, also does not hesitate to interfere in appropriate cases in order to mitigate the harsher effects of these special laws. I look forward to the uh, lecture that is going to be delivered today by Madam Justice Kashifa Hussain, and I hope that it will give an opportunity uh, in the open discussion session which will follow for all of you to uh, discuss the topic further, clarify your own understanding of the topic, and also make your own contributions to the discussion. And with that, it is my great privilege and honor to welcome and uh, Madam Justice Kashifa Hussain and request her to give her speech. Thank you. Uh, my Lord Justice Sayyid Rifat Ahmed and learned advocates and ladies and gentlemen, good, after, good morning, I should say. I should still, still say, it's, yes, it is still good morning, I guess. It's not 12. Good morning. Uh, it is a privilege for me today to be in, invited by this very eager, enthusiastic, and scholarly young lawyers, young lawyers of the Supreme Court. Uh, about this, the, whatever I'm going to speak today, I'd just like to share, introduce, um, before introduce, um, make an introduction in the sense that these are actually very personal thoughts, I should say, which had come to me or which had really, or should be, have been a concern at the back of my mind from time to time when I came across these laws, whether in the capacity as in the bar or ever since I have been elevated to the bench. Uh, there are some which I wanted to share at one stage. Uh, I wanted to share with my mem with, uh, with fellow members at the bar and with my colleagues in the bench. And I thought this is the when uh, Anita came forward to me. I thought this, actually I wrote this article for a magazine, uh, for a legal magazine about a year back. And I thought this is the, when Anita came forward to me, I thought this is the right time and the, uh, just that this would be the appropriate forum to present my views. As I'm saying, these are my views. Whatever I'm saying, my views, and you are all at liberty to differ. <laughs> so, so let me start, okay? Uh, I just uh, started just as the article is. The certitude that, la that laws and the various bows, limbs, okay, okay. okay. It, is, uh, it is titled, as you, uh, as you have seen there, laws, special laws and effects. By effects, I mean 
basically the adverse effects because the of course the, as i say the benefit the, the benefits are there and there is it goes without saying that there are advantages and benefits to special law the benefits are but i would really i am my anxiety arises from as i said basically from the adverse effect which can have an adverse effect not only on the individual but on the state at large taking every everybody as um, concertedly or cum and it can have it cumulative effects that's why uh, i would like to read this article okay laws special laws and effects the certitude that laws and the various boughs limbs and offshoots flowing from from it are created and enacted are for the benefits of man and society at large and not vice versa needs no corroboration with the evolution of society and man each society grew and evolved its own laws and rules in conformity with the customs conventions and prejudices of a particular society religion and tradition undoubtedly played and till date perform a major role in the making of laws in many societies the history of the laws of bangladesh are no exception although most of our statutory laws are a continuation evolving from the colonial era yet many new laws were enacted from time to time to accommodate the contemporaneous contemporaneous scenarios of an ever changing society not to speak of the personal laws relating to marriage inheritance and some others which are essentially guided by the religion of the in, of the individual there is no denying that these laws have for the major part evolved proving to be beneficial towards the interest of the citizens broadly speaking including all others who may be subject to such laws but yet unfortunately enough in many instances several of the laws we have seen from time to time reigning over the statutory regime have contrarily proved to be stringent and indifferent towards the interests of the citizens some of the statutory laws particularly in the garb of special laws conversely turned out to be almost inimical sometimes inimical and hostile to the interests of ordinary citizens in general and to the individual in particular and may lead to far reaching consequences affecting or adversely or rather adversely affecting social and economic equilibrium and balance there are numerous examples of some of the rigidly stringent enactments which often fail to ensure proper justice and fairness in judicial proceedings moreover in all practicalities some of the special laws enacted often have discriminatory effects leading to lack of fairness failing to ensure justice within its proper def definition it does not need to be restated that judges however are bound by these laws and the duty of judges are to interpret the laws and at the most develop them but enacting the laws rules whatsoever are the duty of the legislators and to those all others to whom the task of formulating laws are often delegated to while as a judge while deciding a case sometimes it can be quite frustrating for judges when faced with a provision of a statute rules or by rules which apparently are either appear rather inadequate or discriminatory in themselves and leaves narrow scope to ensure justice to the common citizen or any other person subject to such laws the effect of a few laws enacted as special law or as it has come from the uh, as a as a custom special law as it has been defined by the higher courts have from time to time proved to be discriminatory and draconian on the face of it let me start with the orthurin adalat ayn of 1991 it is a financial law instances of such statutory provisions can be found for can be found for example in the orthurin adalat ayn of 1991 later amended to in 2003 yes this enactment 
as it appears to me, is by its very language a partial and discriminating law. It is being preferential to the banks and other financial institutions within its purview. At the onset, the law provides, I haven't brought the books though, but the, at the onset you will find that the law provides that a bank or any financial institution can file a case against any person who allegedly owes money to it, but not vice versa. The option is not there. The other person cannot, do not have the same option. I mean, the bank is not an infallible, uh, I mean, it is not an infallible institution. Nobody is, nobody is, none of us are for that matter. But it cannot, no, they cannot proceed against the banks. The procedure of recovery of loans from the judgment debtor or guarantor as provided for in the Orthuri Nadalat Ayn is stringent and inequitable to say the least. The law is designed in a manner which is expressly, as I said, favorable towards banks and other financial institutions. The courts, even if aware of the discriminatory attitude of the law, cannot but in most cases, cannot but only interpret the law as it is and decide the cases likewise. At least, to me, it appears like that, because if it is a special law, you have to be confined within the law as much as possible. Because the speciality of the law defines it as such. It is a special law, so you have to be confined within the law. Section 34. Section, uh, let me concentrate on section 34 of the Ayn, uh, because section 12 uh, is there, section, there are many other sections, but section 34, uh, it has, it is really been a, uh, been a matter of anxiety, in the sense that section 34 of the Orthurin Adalot Ayn is a clear specimen of a draconian provision in the garb of special law. It is the provision empowering any Orthurin Adalot to pass an order for civil confinement or prison against a judgment debtor on the prayer of, a, of the decree holder bank in the event of non-payment of the decretal amount. This particular provision itself may, in my opinion, may give chances to lead the bank to misuse or abuse the option. In many cases, it is true that provision of civil prison is there in the Code of Civil Procedure too. But the difference is that CPC, Code of Civil Procedure being a part of the general law, while interpreting it, the courts have the discretion to balance it with equity. But unfortunately, so far as the special laws are concerned, the courts are for the most part bound to a strict interpretation of it leaving little or rather no room at all for equitable considerations. In society, though not in all cases, yet often any person or persons may be unable to pay off a mortgage or a loan or a decretal amount due to compelling circumstances beyond his or her control. The civil courts often recognize such exigencies a person may be faced with pursuant to evidential support, of course, and leave scope for the, some scope for the courts to arrive at an equitable finding, striking a proportionate balance between justice and equity tempered with compassion. Such equity or compassion is next to impossible, in my opinion, while sitting in justice over an orthodox case or similar other special laws. There are also no provisions in the Orthurin Ayn for remedy in case of hardship. Although the Ayn of 2003 is of civil nature and in the absence of specific provisions, the provisions of the CPC are, are applicable, but for the provisions speci specifically provided for, the only option is to follow the special provisions of the Ayn leading often to discrimination and partiality towards the bank or any financial in institutions causing misery to the loanee or judgment debtor, guarantor, whatever the case may be. Uh, now I'd like to come to section 138 of the Negotiable Instruments Act, which I also, th I also feel at this point of time needs some attention. 
Another example of the propensity of special laws leaning more towards benefit of banks lacking transparency, I'd say, lacking transparency in procedural laws finds expression in section 138 of the Negotiable Instruments Act 1881. The procedure laid down in section 138.1 ABC categorically states the rigorous and inflexible procedure followed up by a notice to the drawer of a dishonored check leading to the harsh consequence of rigorous imprisonment for a term of one year or with fine or with both in the event of failure to pay the amount within 30 days of receipt of the notice. The language of section 138 of the NI Act, in particular the provision of rigorous imprisonment, denotes the event of check dishonor as a criminal offense. Yet the Act, it is a criminal offense. It follows the, uh, the Code of Criminal Procedure. But yet the Act has, it is particularly noted that the Act has not however balanced such a rigorous provision with adequate rules and procedures providing for transparency of the banks in its dealing with the deposits or account holder, accounts, deposits, deposits, accounts, accounts holder who might have accounts or deposits with any bank or in any other capacity whatsoever. The act provides little provisions or scope to ensure transparency and accountability of the banks. The incidence of such special laws may pose a threat to social and economic harmony and parity, engendering serious imbalance ascribed to the criminal sanctions provided for in section 138 on one hand, and the significant absence of rules, failure to ensure transparency and accountability of the banks towards the public. It is, as I said, it is often frustrating for the judiciary while while dealing with the case under the provisions of the Act. Because as I said, the judiciary can only interpret the law and not go beyond it. We cannot make the laws. We are not the lawmakers. So needless to state that such discriminating provisions, lacunas and inadequacies, triggers uncertainty generating severe imbalance and disharmony, both from a societal perspective and from commercial aspects. Such discriminatory laws are not desirable and gives rise to the apprehension that they may lead to social and economic discordance and imbalance. Uh, next, I would like to draw my attention I would beg, uh, to the Income Tax Act 1984 and particularly one provision of it. I have just concentrated on one provision because an exhaustive one is not possible to uh, discuss. Anyone conversant with the Income Tax Act 1984 cannot overlook some of the abrasive and harsh provisions of the ordinance which prima facie are discriminatory in approach, being conflicted and inconsistent as it appears to me with the fundamental rights guaranteed under the Constitution. A glaring example of such inconsistency and conflict with the Constitution to me is particularly section 117 of the Income Tax Ordinance. The provisions of this section expressly empower an income tax official to enter the premises of any person, including the registered residence of any person, on the ground, what is the ground? That the concerned authorities have reason to believe. The law has just stated that the concerned authority, the deputy commissioner or whoever, has the reason to believe. They have not really uh, explained as to what this reason to believe, how their belief arises from, or what their relief comes from. It has just stated, reason to believe that any person subject to tax is somehow in possession of money, documents, etc., and which that person is not accounting for with the objective to evade taxation. They just come to their conclusions, or rather jump to it. Clothing, uh, in my view, clothing a concerned income tax official with such sweeping powers to enter upon a per person's private premises relying on only reason to believe can set a dangerous precedent violating the right to privacy, including safety and security. Section 117 gives the impression 
to be directly conflictive with Article 43A of the Constitution, which guarantees protection to be secured in a person's home against entry, search, and seizure. Of course, uh, there are ways to enter a person's home, but as far as the income tax law is concerned, only reason to believe seems to be a very uncertain, a, a very uncertain expression, a very uncertain expression. Though the article qualifies such protections subject to conditions imposed by law, yet only, in my opinion, reason to believe hardly denotes or ensure much transparency or clarity in this whole exercise of power being authorized to enter a person's private premises on the, pre on the pretext of having, on the pretext rather of having reason to believe only and is violative of the fundamental rights guaranteed under the Constitution. Uh, next, I'd like to draw my attention to a particular provision of the Family Courts uh, Act of, 1980, of 1885. Like extending these thoughts to personal laws, for instance, the Family Courts Act 1885 consists of some lacunas and disabling provisions which ought to be addressed by legislators to ensure equality and harmony in procedural law. Section 20, Section 20 of the Family Courts Act 1885 has proved to be a disabling section, debarring the applicability of the Evidence Act 1872 and further provides that saving sections 10 and 11 of the Family Courts Act 1885, no other provisions of the Code of Civil Procedure 1908 shall apply in proceedings before a family court. Proceedings in a family court are essentially civil in nature, but yet the disabling section 20 leads to unequal treatment between a family court proceeding and in a proceeding under the code. Because of the disabling section 20, one of the consequences of the disabling, disabling provision is the unavailability of the scope to amend a plaint in a family court proceeding. Amendment of plaint. Amendment of plaint is available under Order 6, Rule 17 of the code of the Code of Civil Procedure applicable to suits and proceedings of civil nature. And I'd say under all circumstances, a family case is always a, uh, um, a um, is mostly a, fam a family courts act is, uh, is, a si is a statute of civil nature, to say the least. But since the Family Courts Act of 1885 has not provided for the scope to amend a plaint to say the least, it can be considerably frustrating to find that there is no scope to amend a plaint in a proceeding in a family court. The disability created by Section 20 is now somehow settled by decisions, including that of our appellate division, reported in 1 BLC AD, page 24, in the case of Muhammad Azad Alam versus Jainab Khatun, where it was held that. In view of the bar of section 20 of the Family Courts Ordinance, the plaint cannot be amended. And the story ended there. And the story ended there. Our appellate division decided it, and obviously it ended there. This disability, much to the detriment of the plaintiff in a suit before a family court, in all probabilities may give rise to a situation where there could be even an arithmetical and inadvertent mistake. Not due to any fault of the plaintiff and which because of the disabling section 20 cannot be amended or rectified by way of amendment of plaint. As I said, there could be even an inadvertent arithmetical or inadvertent mistake. It is to be noted that a large number of these suits are filed for dower, maintenance, maintenance of children, etc., where the plaintiff is the wife. This in the indifference and apathy of the law apart towards unequal treatment among suits of similar nature also works against the material interests of the plaintiff wife, often depriving her unfairly of the accurate amount of money or any other economic or material benefits she may be entitled to in accordance with law. Because of the disabling provision, because a plaint cannot be amended, and because the, even an inadvertent and arithmetical mistake cannot be amended because of the disabling provision and which I said has been settled by our Apex Court. Uh, a study into some 
of, uh, of the provisions of our special laws within the realm of laws relating to criminal offenses, offense offenses reveal serious imbalance and disproportion between the severity of offenses and the maximum punishment imposed in a particular section as a result of commission of a particular offense. Here I have kind of, uh, I, had, I had attracted Special Powers Act 1974. I have examined some parts of Special Powers Act as I have come across it in, uh, in my capacity. In some of the special, of the special statutory enactments, including the Special Powers Act 1974, apart from the const constitutional validity of some of the provisions being questionable, there is no gainsaying that offenses, although of different genre and different scales of severity, yet the severity or extent of the maximum punishment imposed in pursuance of conviction of such offense against such offenses are more often than not the same, however different the one genre of offense might be from another. They are the same. We have seen in several uh, portions of the Special Powers Act, the same or, 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 or any other law that the, however the different the genre of offenses may be from one another, but the uh, maximum punishment imposed is the same. For example, maximum punishment imposed upon offenses under sections 25A, 25B, and 25C of the Special Powers Act is death, is death. Section 25A deals with offenses for dealing with counterfeit currency notes, etc., which is basically a financial crime, while Section B deals with the offense of smuggling. Simultaneously, if we look into some of the anti-terrorism laws, we find that the maximum punishment which may be imposed therein is also death. More often than not, we don't need to remind anyone that these acti the activities involving terrorism result in manslaughter causing death and other heinous offenses. Upon comparison, it appears that under the provisions of some of these special laws, the same amount and extent of punishment is imposed against such offenses that are financial or monetary in nature and those relating to activities of terrorism which may result in manslaughter. At least in my opinion, it defies all notion of reasonableness and logic including the principles of natural justice and fairness to suggest, to even suggest that, that an equal amount of punishment may be imposed against offenses which are essentially financial crimes and those offenses that may result in murder, manslaughter or other heinous offenses against humanity. These are because manslaughter is basically uh, an offense against humanity. A study of these inconsistent provisions provide the scope to reflect on our social system and maybe the judicial uh, process too. A proper reflection reveals acute disharmony, discrimination, lack of parity and imbalance in the whole system being detrimental to the, to the interests of the public and the individual at large and the state of course in the end. Uh, Another, another piece of enactment which attracted my attention in recent years, of course, uh, it is being, I, th I guess it is being repla replaced by the Digital Security Act, but Section 57 of the ITC Act, it, it did attract my attention. Uh, while sitting on bench also in the criminal courts, it attracted my attention. And I'd like to, maybe it is going to be replaced soon, very soon, if it is not already on board. Is the Digital Security Act already on board? Can anyone uh, enlighten me? Uh, or it will be on board. Uh, probably Section 57 will be, uh, as far as I heard, section, section 57 will be probably replaced by that act. But till now, Section 57 is on board. And I asked one of my colleagues, yes, cases are still being filed under Section 57 till day before yesterday it was filed. So, so I think I can still discuss it. A significant and often question piece of enactment in our statutory regime in the recent decade is the Information and Communication Technology Act 2006, which was enacted with the intent to counter offenses relating to cybercrimes. 
whatever the intentions of the legislators might have been at the time of the enactment of the statute, yet some of the provisions of the Act, particularly Section 57, appears to be somehow inconsistent with the fundamental rights guaranteed under the Constitution. Upon an examination of Section 57, the first thing that prima facie causes to raise concern is the vague and unclear manner in which, very, as I say, very vague and unclear. We have to remember that the vague and unclear manner in which the section expresses itself. Section 57 of the ITC Act of 2006 provides for imposition of a maximum punishment of, imp of imprisonment of up to 14 years for committing an offense under this section. So that is quite a serious punishment, no? The section makes, this section as I have noted, makes, uh, makes publishing in, within uh, quote unquote, fake, obscene, or defaming information in electronic form, quote unquote, an offense, okay? Fake, obscene, or defaming information in electronic form and offense. It further goes on to state that anything which may corrupt or deprave, quote unquote, or deprave, quote unquote, persons, and again, quote unquote, causes to deteriorate or creates possibility to deteriorate law and order, quote unquote, including, quote unquote, prejudicing the image of the state and hurting, quote unquote, hurting religious belief, etc., comes as offenses under this section. Okay. And leaves it at that. Th leaves it at that. Why I'm saying leaves it at that? Because they have not elaborated it. The provisions of this section appears to be more of a cause of concern given that the legislation has not elaborated or analyzed nor have they given any guidelines, nor have any guidelines been provided as to what acts or conduct may be regarded to have the potential or ingredients to corrupt or deprave another. There is no, I'm not saying that there should be an exhaustive list because it is not, I also understand the drawbacks of the, the shortcomings of the legislators in that it is not always possible to provide an exhaustive list of what, but at least there should be a minimum guideline, but there are no guidelines. Neither has the enactment laid down any guidelines as to what acts may be prejudicial to the image of the state. Uh, well, when they are saying prejudicial to the image of the state, prejudicial, what acts are exactly prejudicial? To a general reader or to a general public, maybe those who belong to the legal profession may be more conversant as to we may be more conscious, but to the general public, they often do not know. For the most part, they are not even aware of what is, what could be prejudicial to the image of the state. The expressions used in section 57 are very much in general terms, vague. The absence of definite, guide, of definite guidelines has been a cause of concern to all persons subject to the act. Unfortunately enough, in recent times, we have seen numbers of cases being filed under Section 57 of the ITC Act, and it has been often difficult to ascertain whether an offense that constitutes any of the ingredients mentioned in the section has actually been committed. The generality of the terms used in the section is a matter of anxiety in the absence of any guidelines. It is given that it has not set out a yardstick or at least an adequate description of the type of con act or conduct that might constitute an offense under the section. Absence of definite guidelines escalates the chance of misuse of the law by the concerned authorities and also by any other person upon misusing the section to harass some other person. Moreover, the constitution validity of the section could be open to challenge. Upon research and scrutiny, I have, I have kind of uh, finished discussing the laws, so now I'll come to the uh, concluding part. Upon research and scrutiny, several other lacunas, inadequacies, discrimination may be divulged from the statutory enactments discussed here in other laws, but an exhaustive list of which is difficult to complete. But it is desirable for the larger interests of all that the legislators and others to whom the task of making laws and rules are often delegated to should, should address these lacunas 
inadequacies and discrimination in the special provisions of laws discussed here, including lacunas and discrimination that may exist in any other enactment. Imbalance in the laws, it goes without saying, escalate misuse of the laws, often causing impediments in good governance and rule of law. It will not be an exaggeration to state that it is now imperative upon the legislators to rethink and revisit these statutory enactments with the objective to re-evaluate re the laws and take steps to formulate new laws by necessary amendments or supplements to the existing laws. The objective of these laws ought to be able to strike a fine balance between creating effective and sustainable deterrent against committing offenses on one hand while simultaneously remaining vigilant that none of the provisions of the fundamental rights of any citizens or any other person as is guaranteed under the Constitution are violated or adversely affected. Amendments, changes, supplements in several laws and formulation of rules and bylaws are imperative for ensuring parity, equal treatment, good governance and justice in its essential sense. Uh, revisiting the financial laws it is true that the special provisions of financial law, especially the Arthurinite uh, Adalatine 1991, was originally and nearly enacted with the intention to stem the abuse of the process by borrowers, which is rampant, of course, stem of abuse. It is, goes without saying that borrowers also abuse the process rampantly. And the law has in many, it has its benefits, and the law has in many cases proved to be beneficial in stemming fraud. But it, in this context, it is also necessary to remind the legislators that proactive initiative is imperative to balance the advantages and disadvantages, including the benefits and drawbacks, and attempt to formulate the special statutory provisions of law in such a manner that it may create a level playing field for both stakeholders and the financial institutions. This is as far as the financial laws are concerned. That there has to be a level playing field. When the laws are made, the laws must, it is a, the, the provisions it expresses through must create a level playing, playing field between the stakeholders and the financial, uh, and the banks or financial institutions. In conclusion, it is hoped that in the near future, the legislators will take more proactive interest in ensuring that laws are form formulated in such a manner that they may protect the fundamental rights of those subject to it and further ensure parity and equal treatment by the laws. It may be further hoped that the legislators will not remain apathetic or indifferent to their task. Thank you. Thank you all. So thank you very much, Madam. I, it, it falls upon me. Thank you very much. And before we conclude today's proceedings, I would request my Lord, Mr. Justice Sayyid Rafat Ahmed to give to you a particular, uh, I, I would request him to come to the stage. No. As after, uh, I'll wait until Sayyid Justice, my Lord, Mr. Justice Sayyid Rafat Ahmed makes the presentation. Yeah, thank, right. you, thank you. Thank you.